the basis of standard biomechanics is that the body holds up by the physical structure of the skeleton. This is the premise they're starting with. So when they're doing any work, they've got this is their paradigm that underlies it. In, let's see, this is in 1964, Nakamson and Morris did some in vivo intradiscal pressure measurements. Nakamson was professor of uh, orthopedics at the Carolina Institute in Sweden, and he made his international reputation on this paper. He became internationally famous in orthopedic circles and stayed that way. Now, he was a pretty good guy. He actually uh, spoke a lot about the, the overuse of spinal surgery and things like that. For this study, he, he actually put pressure transducers into discs to do the pressure on the disc and showed that when you're recumbent, it's about 30. These are in kilopascals, but you can see the proportion. So, you know, lying like this is 30 kilo, and then it's 60. Then you're standing, it's 80. Then, then you bend over, it's 100. And if you lift the weight, it's 340. And then you sit down, you go back down to 100. But if you sit down and lean forward, it's 120. And the worst thing in the world you can do is bend forward and try and lift something up because that increases the pressure on your spine. The basis of this whole thing was we now have a measurement where we are, this was interpreted as loading the spine, compression loading the spine, because they actually did pressures when somebody was doing things in live. Now, before this, everything was calculated. And it still is all into internal force that calculated, except for pressures, which you can do like blood pressure and bladder pressure and uh, any closed space pressure you can measure. So as a uh, spinal fluid pressure, so you can measure pressures internally, but you can't measure forces and there's a difference, which they don't discuss. And worse than that, they don't recognize. Forces have a direction. Pressures are omnidirectional. The Morris involved in this, it was not Nakamson and Morris, is the same guy who gave us this calculated tremendous force on the spine, which of course the spine can't handle. And it's part of that same concept that the spine is a column that holds you up. And so you get this disc, and you have body weight on it that is compressing the disc, you get a load and you get pressures coming out of that load and you can read the pressure. And the concept is there is a continuing load through the disc into the, the spine and it's just one compression loaded spinal column. Well, this is an automobile. What you do is you put the automobile on the scale and it reads, registers the weight of the vehicle, right? So that's the compression force of a loaded structure. And then you take the tire pressure. And the tire pressure is uh, about two atmospheres. All right, now, the thing is, if you increase the pressure in the tire, does the load change any? No. If the pressure goes up, doesn't mean there's a transmitted load through the structure. Okay, now, Let's say we load up the vehicle and put this big heavy load on top of the vehicle. Does the pressure in the tire increase? No. So what happens is you, the pressure, if you load the vehicle, it doesn't make any difference what you do with it, you'll get an increased weight here, load, direct force load, but the air pressure will not change. It's easy enough to do. You take your automobile, you take the tire pressure and see what it is. You jack up the car up on, on a jack and take the prior pressure. It's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. If the bicycle tire has an atmosphere, a pressure of, of approximately four atmospheres as opposed to two in an automobile tire, but it doesn't change the force going to the ground. It doesn't make any difference. You're talking about two different things. Because pressure goes in all directions 
and, and pushes up against the walls of the structure and pushes out against the wall. But there is no force transmitted from the wall out. Pressure is an internal force that is controlled within the structure. So in loading a tire with the rate of a car, there is no uh, change in the air pressure. However, uh, loading a disc with the weight of a body shows that there is an increase in the interdiscal uh, pressure. It is clear that different things are happening in the disc and in the uh, tire. In both the disc and the tire, pressure is an internal force, not an external force. So, Steve. Yeah? Why, then why would there be different pressure readings with postural changes? Ah, easy question. <laughs> Good. Here's, here's, the, here's what you're doing is you've got this structure here. And as you load this structure, which of course is a tensegrity icosahedron, you're putting tension on the system. What you've shown is that you've actually shrunk this space because it's the only way you can increase pressure unless you heat it up. You can either heat it up or shrink the space. So to shrink the space means that you did it oxetically. And if you did an oxetic shrinking, it means you're talking with tensegrity structures. So what he really proved was that the disc is a tensegrity structure. So they're not actually measuring pressure then? You're measuring pressure in the disc, but it is, doesn't leave the disc. It remains in its container just as soda stays in its can. That pressure is within the disc. It's a closed system. The increase in pressure is evidence of transmission of a force. It'd be like if I stood on a scale and did a Valsalva maneuver and increased my intra-abdominal pressure that I would expect to, that the scale would show I was 10 pounds heavier. It, exactly. And right. it doesn't. It, uh, I'm sure it doesn't. I, I wish I could do it in reverse and lose a few pounds. Is there, is there any sense that the, the disc can, can change character? For instance, if it, would, a, would a weight lifter, lifter's discs end up being stronger in some way? Absolutely. Wow. And they have to. You know, but the way you're doing is you're increasing the tension in the whole system. The disc is a living structure and should respond to stress just like any other tissue in the body does. The origin of the discs, of course, start with fish and then quadrupeds. It doesn't get to us for a long time. So that the spine and the disc were not, did not evolve as a, as a vertical structure. It developed as a way of flexibly linking two rigid elements so that the front and the back of the uh, creature running uh, or swimming could function in a continuously linked system, much like linking boxcars on a train. The disc then functions much like a universal joint, uh, linking two rigid elements and allowing uh, a transmission of forces and movement to between two rigid bodies. This concept is not new and was proposed by Grekovetsky in his book, The Spinal Engine. What would be new is the recognition that that type of motion is easily produced in a, a tensegrity structure. With the pressure popping up and down as it does, it surely is an energy storage system as well. So if you take a disk and look at its structure and recognize that the structure is really a tensegrity structure, then we can rethink the mechanics of a disc and understand why the pressure within a disc goes up uh, when it's under load. So the measurements that they took, yeah. all those measurements that they put on that graph, yeah. those measurements are just telling us how oxetically condensed the disc becomes? All they're telling you is that the pressure in the disc is increasing. Everything else is interpretation. Since we know that it's the only way the pressure can increase is if that space decreases. 
because you have an incompressible structure. But what you're saying is that you, you have to decrease the space to increase the pressure. You can deduce from that 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 space is decreased and the mechanism that we know that does is, is the oxidic mechanism in a um, uh, tensegrity. Now, in a tire, what happens is you squish the tire and the walls expand in the other direction. So that, that stress is taken up in the expansion of the walls. You don't change the volume, you just stretch them out in different ways. What is missing is the understanding of internal and external forces. Here we have a can of soda pop. We immerse it in water and we have the molecules of water pressing on the can, uh, putting it under external pressure. Inside the can, there is internal pressure trying to get out. It is the walls of the container that do all the work. The internal and external pressure in the can and in the water have no effect on each other and do not change. You increase my intraocular pressure, it doesn't do anything to the pressure of my body on the floor. Right. It's an internal force. You increase my blood pressure, and it still doesn't do anything to my body mass. It just increases the pressure. But the force on the floor does not change. So, so they measured the pressure in the disc in these different postures, and deduced from that that there was an increased load passing through the disc into the vertebral bodies, which confirm their concept that the spine is a column. But nobody stopped to say, hey, wait a minute, you can't do that. The pressure is independent of load. Load has a sense, a direction. Pressure is omnidirectional, but the, you measure it by the perpendicular force against the walls of its container. The model used by Nakamson as of a disc under compression is a faulty model based on the compression loaded uh, system uh, block on block. Uh, we now know better. We know that the body is a tensegrity structure and a disc uh, in the spine is really in the center of a uh, tensegrity network. Mm -hmm.